Welcome to everyone. I'm James Jensen, today's webinar chair. I am a contractor supporting the Office of Indian Energy Policy and Programs Tribal Energy Webinar Series. Today's webinar, titled Energy Projects and Workforce Development, a Win-Win Opportunity, is the seventh webinar of the 2021 BUE Tribal Energy Webinar Series. Let's go over some event details. Today's webinar is being recorded and will be made available on BUE's Office of Indian Energy Policy and Programs website in about one week. Copies of today's presentation slides have been posted and we will post the link um, for those slides uh, in the chat shortly. Everyone will receive a post-webinar email with the link to the page where the slides and recording will be located. Because we are recording this webinar, all phones have been muted. We will answer your written questions at the end of the final presentation. You can submit a question at any time by clicking on the question button located in the webinar control box on your screen and typing your question. Let's get started with some opening remarks from Rosanna Pierce. Ms. Pierce is a senior engineer and the deployment supervisor for the Office of Indian Energy Policy and Programs. She's duty stationed in Golden, Colorado. She is responsible for the execution and of the deployment program, which is national in scope. Specifically, the deployment program includes financial assistance, technical assistance, and education and outreach. She also implements national funding opportunities and administers some of the resultant tribal energy project grants and agreements. She has over 25 years of experience in project development and management and has been assisting tribes in developing their energy resources for over 20 years. Ms. Pierce holds a Bachelor's of Science degree in Mechanical Engineering from Colorado State University. Zana, the virtual floor is now yours. Thank you, James, and hello, everyone. I join James in welcoming you to today's webinar. Uh, this webinar series is sponsored by the Office of Indian Energy Policy and Programs, otherwise referred to as the Office of Indian Energy. The Office of Indian Energy promotes Indian energy development, efficiency, and use, helps to reduce or stabilize costs, enhances and strengthens Indian tribal energy and economic infrastructure related to natural resource development and electrification, and brings electrical power and service to Indian homes and lands. And I'm going to apologize that there's a little bit of back, back, background noise. Um, so, so, so please bear with us. It, and everybody, can you go on mute, please? So to provide this assistance, our deployment program partners with Indian tribes and Alaska Native villages to overcome the barriers to energy development. Our development program, deployment program is composed of a three-prong approach consisting of financial assistance through competitive grants, technical assistance at no cost to tribes and tribal entities, and education and capacity building. So this tribal energy webinar series is just one example of our education and capacity building efforts. Specifically, the webinar series is intended to provide attendees with information and tools and resources to develop and implement tribal energy plans, programs, and projects, to highlight tribal energy case studies, and to identify business strategies tribes can use to expand their energy options and develop sustainable local economies. This year's webinar series is focusing on how tribal energy projects can improve community resilience, foster economic development, and support environmental stewardship. In this seventh webinar of the series, we'll explore how workforce development can be an important part of energy project development. Workforce development is particularly important for sustaining energy projects in rural areas, not unlike much of Indian country, and incorporating training and utilizing a local workforce to install and maintain energy systems can be particularly valuable not only for sustaining these projects, but also for providing local jobs. We do hope the webinar series is useful um, and the series as a whole. So we welcome your feedback. If you have or would like to provide any feedback, you know, please um, send an email to our main email address at indianenergy at hq.doe.gov. Before I turn it back to James, I want to personally thank each of the presenters for giving of their time and their willingness to share during today's webinar. And thank you for the audience for your interest as well. And with that, I'm gonna turn it back over to James. Thank you, Lozana. Before we get to today's presentations, I will introduce all of our presenters. For our first presentation, we will hear from Henry Redcloud. 
Henry is a 21st century Lakota warrior bringing social justice and economic development to the American communities through renewable energy and sustainable building projects and training. A direct descendant of Chief Red Cloud, the last Lakota war chief, Henry was born and raised on Pine Ridge Reservation in South Dakota, home of the Ogallala uh, Lakota tribe. He strives to provide his people with a new vision for the future while still maintaining their important traditions, cultural heritage, and deep connection to Mother Earth. Henry is a chief of the Oglala Lakota tribe and has an honorary doctor of public service from Washington College. He is also the executive director of the 501c3 nonprofit organization, Red Cloud Renewable. The mission of Red Cloud Renewable is to stimulate a significant revisioning of tribal communities where energy is created in renewable ways, meals are nutritional and fortified with traditional Lakota foods, homes are built in a sustainable way with local builders, the materials in the land are cared for uh, and regenerated with the next seven generations in mind. Following Chief Red Cloud, we will hear from Chantel Green. Chantel is a Nez Perce tribal planner, where among other things, she is working on solar energy development, workforce development, and sustainable building. Previously, she served as an elected vice chairwoman of the Nez Perce Tribal Council. She holds a master's of legal studies in, in indigenous people's law from the University of Oklahoma, a bachelor's of arts in indigenous American Indian studies with an emphasis in environmental justice from Haskell Indian Nations University and an associate of Science, Health, Sport, and Exercise Science degree, also from Haskell Indian Nations University. Following Chantel, we will have a joint presentation from Melissa Weatherwax and Tim Willink, along with uh, a couple of um, uh, new trainees. Melissa Weatherwax is a member of the Blackfoot Confederacy located in Montana and Alberta, Canada. She and her husband have raised their children on Little Badger, Two Medicine Rivers on the Blackfeet Reservation. She is a lifelong learner of Blackfeet language and Blackfeet ways of knowing. She has built her career at Blackfeet Community College for the past 19 years. Her experience includes education reform, student support, and campus development. Tim Willink has served as Director of Grid Alternatives Tribal Program for the last five years. Tim joined from joined GRID from Namaste Solar, where he worked for six years as a field supervisor for commercial solar installations. Tim is NABSEP certified, is a NABSEP certified PV pro installation professional. While at Namaste, Tim oversaw over four megawatts of solar PV installations on commercial and residential buildings. Tim earned his Bachelor's of Arts in Economics from Cornell University and upon graduation worked as a lobbyist for the Navajo Nation Washington office representing the tribe in economic development and education. In addition to working with GRID's regional offices in California due to extensive solar PV work with tribes on solar PV installation and workforce development, Tim has helped establish GRID's presence with tribes in South Dakota and the Great Plains. Um, in the Southwest on the Navajo Nation and in Washington State with the Spokane Tribe of Indians. These indigenous nations continue to face economic struggles related to energy development and clean energy access. And Tim and the tribal team work with tribes towards their goals of energy sovereignty job creation with less environmental impact. Tim has also worked to provide training and employment opportunities through Grid Solar Corps program to 15 Solar Corps fellows from indigenous nations throughout the United States. Tim is, is Navajo, originally from Pueblo Pintado, New Mexico, and his goal is to continue to partner with tribes on residential and commercial projects in order to bring solar to tribal communities. For our last presentation, we will hear from Peyton Batliner. Peyton is an economic development specialist and acting branch chief of the Business Services Branch within the Department of Interior's Division of Energy and Mineral Development. He has worked at the division since 2009. He works across all commodity groups in the division and specializes in business planning, financial analysis, and tribal utility formation. Peyton holds an MBA with an emphasis in finance and entrepreneurship from the University of Colorado at Boulder. He is an enrolled member of the Cherokee Nation of Oklahoma and was born on the Pine Ridge Reservation in South Dakota. 
Thanks to all of our presenters for making the time to join us today. With that, let's get started with our first presentation. Henry, you may proceed once your slides are up. Good morning, all. It's great to be here. Great to be in the presence of you all. We're gonna um, we're gonna go to a a short video, and then I got a PowerPoint that I want to share with everybody. So let's uh, let's get started here. Would you please play the video, please? My grandfather said upon seven generation, we would be living in harmony and balance. So we're just walking this prayer. I start doing everything I could under under the life-giving force of, of the sun. So I believe that what we're doing today is part of that. We're in a stage where we all have to start lessening our carbon moccasin print. We continue down this road that we're on, uh, our way of life is gonna be no more. The very first thing I did in 1995 when I reached back here was I, I turned the soil over and started to grow food, to teach people how to grow food teach people how to can food and hopes and prayers that it would spur on to another another seven generations. 2003, I partnered up with some nonprofits. We started a installation on solar furnaces. And in 2006, we actually start manufacturing the solar furnaces. I started to reach out to the other tribe, bring them in and get them the technical support to install these here solar furnaces, helping them to lessen their carbon moccasin print, but helping them to save money. Coexisting with the earth again, and that process creating much needed you know, jobs throughout Indian country. 2008, we opened the door to uh, the Red Cloud Renewable Energy Center, the Sacred Earth Lodge. There, we started to bring forward all of the three phases of solar, hot water, hot air, and solar electric. Now, just last year, we was able to take on the Tribal Train the Trainers program. We was able to get five students representing four tribes certified <laughs> which is called the NABSAC certification. The Wichoni project is taking the old way of living and combining it with a 21st century way and bringing forward that Machpialuta prophecy of unity. So we're gonna build a natural build homes, energy efficient homes, clean energy, grow our own food, and become a sustaining model for other families our Teospayes communities to adopt this here, you know, program to create that livelihood. Living in harmony, balance, and, and coexisting with the earth and being the proud people that, that our ancestors were. Oste, thank you. Now we'll go on to my uh, presentation. So, uh, yes, we're located in the southwest corner of South Dakota, home of Oglala Lakota. At Red Cloud Renewable, we're working with tribes. We're currently working with over 70 of the federally recognized tribes. Overall, there's 574 federally recognized tribes. So we're 
uh, scratching the surface, you know, so to speak, uh, bringing on solar training and creating green teams throughout the uh, throughout the country. Uh, so we're uh, we've been in existence now with the training facility for uh, we're going on 14 years. Uh, today we have uh, we just wrapped up a, a another of our T4 programs. Currently, we have 14 native students representing nine different tribes that are certified with the national certification. Um, and uh, we're replicating that program every year. So uh, followed by that, uh, that uh, national certification training, it's a five week course. Uh, following that, we have our professional installers course that happens immediately right after so next slide please so this is uh uh so again working with you know 70 tribes creating we created over 600 plus jobs in our hot air uh off-grid tiny homes reforestation uh we've been doing uh so targeting those areas as well as uh, creating that, you know, coexisting with the earth again, bringing that back to families. I, uh, I returned back and started to ask this here simple question to my Lakota relatives. If there was a, a wish and that, and, and that could happen immediately, a dream, uh, a vision that can happen immediately, what would that be? I felt a, um, I felt I needed to ask this question. And uh, I asked a lot of people here in the homeland and it didn't take them long to respond. And they, their response was, I would like to get back to the old homestead. I would like to get back coexisting with the land, being healthier and, and doing that. So I found myself, uh, um, how does one do that in Indian country? How does one, uh, you know, get back to the old homestead and found myself uh, within the Bureau of Indian Affairs and asking questions and that and and helping people to get back to the land and then bringing, I found it that there was, we needed much needed jobs and, and I spent, a, I spent a, a night out in the country up on the hill and envisioned solar at that time. I spent a night reaching out to the the morning sun as as uh, as she crested the eastern horizon and reaching out to her and feeling her awesome energy at that time and saying, okay, this is what we need to be doing. So I basically took our old way of, of uh, warriors and and uh, staking myself to the ground and tying my tying myself off to it, tying my ankle off to it and saying, this is where I stand. This is what we're gonna do and this is how we're gonna do it. Next slide, please. So this is our recent team that went and came through and, and uh, did our, our uh, professional installation course. Again, we had uh, seven representing tribes throughout the Northern Plains. Uh, we, we did a, a tremendous, you know, job. This was uh, this was taught by the past NABSAC certification students that that passed that certification course. They came in and they were the instructors. So uh, you can see uh, pretty much all native here, except for yeah, we're everybody's native here. Instructors and that they were able to teach this course. Then the following week after, we all traveled up to Standing Rock up in North Dakota with uh, uh, over in uh, uh, Fort Yates, North Dakota. We went up there and we, we worked and installed a 10 kilowatt grid tie uh, installation there. So the students here that, that took the course were all up there and installed this here 10 kilowatt really happy really proud of them uh doing the work and doing the things that they're doing as you can see we have some you know females in here as well as some males 
all again representing different tribes from the Diné to Oklahoma to Montana to uh, to the Northern Plain, North and South Dakota, Nebraska, Minnesota. Uh, next slide, please. So yeah, this is uh, our classroom as as uh, the uh, uh, native instructors here um, teaching the course of uh, Grid Tie 101. Um, we're in partnership with SEI, Solar Energy International, which has been involved as being a training institute since 1990, I believe. Over 40% of the current business owners uh, throughout the country uh, came through their program and uh, and built their businesses, built their installation companies. Namaste came through there. Various um, uh, companies out there doing things uh, throughout the you know country installing solar PV modules uh, arrays from you know two kilowatt to megawatt systems have come through there. There, so we built a partnership up with them in 1997. I was able to build a partnership with them. Met with the co-founder Johnny Weiss out of out of, of Peonia, Colorado, and uh, since then we've been working in partnership, working in in Indian country developing green teams, uh, uh, creating economic opportunities for you know tribal members within their respected areas. Next slide, please. So this was, uh, again, part of uh, the, the training we had. We installed a 22.5 kilowatt system on our Indian radio station here creating, uh, making our our radio station the greenest radio station in, in a country, as well as the greenest within Indian countries. Uh, again, Native instructors led this uh, after they came through our certification course. And, uh, and uh, yeah, so these are students going over, looking at it, uh, doing a little repair, repairing a couple modules, replacing a couple modules. You know, we do um, within our our certification course, within the five week courses, uh, two weeks in a classroom, uh, two weeks out there on the field, getting to know uh, uh, within the, you know, classroom components, how everything works together, looking at, you know, systems, developing building systems on a, on a board, so to speak, and then implementing out there in the field. So uh, I'm very proud of these, these native instructors to you know come aboard and start doing the things that uh you know, you know that we need to be doing as natives uh solar solar plays a huge role in our ancestral ways our song our dance our our ceremony our language uh is all built around the life-giving force of the sun so taking this new way and honoring the old way there and then and then creating economic opportunities, being sustainable, doing our own thing, because we know that that only comes from the people. We know that that only comes from the membership. Becoming that change that you want to see and start moving forward with like like minded thinking relatives. Next slide, please. Yeah, so this is. Uh, some of the lab work, uh, uh, students again come out and and do mini lab stations. Right here, currently, we're we're uh, uh, doing some conduit work, bending conduit, and installing conduit, and doing all of these things. The center guy there, uh, his his name's Chris French. He's from the Yankton Sioux Tribe, and he's an awesome uh, native instructor. He's uh, he's passionate about it, and uh, so the fellows out here on the on the right, we built a partnership with another uh, organization out of Washington State. They they're known as Remote Energy, and the guy on the left here, he's he's from the the Dene Reservation out there with the Navajos. He he came up here and spent five weeks here. So yeah, we got the young 
you know, gentlemen in the back, they're just getting started feeling and just getting started into the into the solar uh, insulation uh, um, industry. So so we're taking we're developing these green teams. Next slide, please. We're developing these here green teams throughout Indian country. We had over 800 students come through our program. Currently, we're looking to to uh, install a a 1.1.10 megawatt system here on on the Pine Ridge. What consists it consists of over 500,000 modules. So uh, we have worked for these green teams for the next year and a half. <coughs> Excuse me. We're looking. <coughs> we're looking to start this year project in the spring. So, uh, uh, followed by uh, uh, getting our tribe is becoming aware and jumping on board because we're uh, uh, um, the WAPA transmission line that's being developed and worked on is a. A five megawatt system, so we can add to that. The tribe wants to get involved, and we're looking to even train more people on this. So, uh, um, very excited here on the home front, uh, as we're all aware of of the possible uh, funding that's going to come from the feds is even going to make this. Uh, you know, uh, there's going to be plenty of work throughout Indian country. Uh, uh, next slide, please. Yeah, every morning we gather up instructors, students, we gather up, we share things from the day before, then we go over, you know, plans on on uh, on what we're going to do. This slide here is only native instructors. All of these are native instructors going through the plan for the day, how how the other day yesterday, what happened, what needs to be. So every day we uh, we commute together, we get together over a, a cup of coffee and then start going over the the plan for uh, for the day um again all of these are are native instructors they have the NABSAC certification next slide please so yeah a little bit of uh of uh again doing some mini lab works and that uh involving students. Uh, students are very interested, as you can see in this slide here. Everybody's so focused on on uh, what has to be said, uh, you know, training and all the tools that, you know, go along with it, uh, special tools. Uh, so yeah, we're just, these students are having a, a great time, you know, being here, uh, just focusing on, the possibilities that that can happen here. We have various lab sites here. Uh, the second slide of of my presentation gave an overall view of all the all the the lab stations that we offer here, from water pumping, a standalone system, grid tie systems, battery based systems. Uh, so students not only come here to learn one thing, but they also Look at all the various other things and become interested in that. And so, over the over the students, the 800 students have that has you know come here, always look to their interest in and you know something else like the water pumping, standalone systems. You know, businesses can cre be created as well as uh, uh, multiple you know jobs underneath that. So we're uh, we're moving forward in this year 21st century way, honoring the old way. Next slide, please. So yeah, NABSAC certification, look at this. And they're they're so happy, excited that they can move forward down this year solar field, down this green path. And uh, you know, the, uh, the endless possibilities, you know, the endless things that can be happening. Um, we need uh, more funding to come to tribes. Uh, more funding needs to happen. So these applications, so students like these, these ones can then uh, live their dream 
and their vision. You know, they're they're totally excited here. Uh, and so, yeah, just wanted to share this slide um, as well as the native instructors within. So next slide, please. Yeah, uh, this is uh, the students after they attended the, the professional installation course here. And we all went up to uh, Standing Rock up there and we installed a, a 10 kilowatt grid tie system. So these are the students that attended the, the workshop that we offered the, the professional installation course. So these, uh, these students are super excited, want to move on. We was able to bring other, other solar you know, companies in and and uh, the other solar companies immediately wanted to hire these here fresh students right off, of, freshly coming off our course. So some of these here students are working today. Uh, next slide, please. <coughs> so yeah, this is uh, some of the instructors here. We're we're pretty excited. Myself, Chris French. Uh, Chris, uh, um, oh, out of R Remote Energy and Silas Redcloud, one of my sons, he's, he's also a instructor here and we're all pointing up towards the sun. That's, that's the power. That's what we need to be doing for the future generations, for the seven generations yet to come. So we're, we're, uh, we're gonna keep moving forward, but uh, we, we're just so, uh, uh, no matter what, we're gonna move forward. Uh, again, like I said, we, uh, uh, if we had more funding, we could do twice as much. So next slide, please. So yeah, let's put our minds together and see what we can do. You know, come visit us, look at our website, become part of our team. And uh, we can we can move down this green path together. You know, I believe NREL, National Renewable Energy Laboratory, did a field study on these 574 federally recognized tribes and found that, that there's a potential of 61 gigawatts to be produced out of these, out of the respected nations throughout the whole country. So yeah, visit us. Come see what we're doing. Stop on by. Uh, let's you know partner up. There's uh, there's no time. There isn't any time to reinvent the wheel. What we need to be doing is partnering up and moving down this green path together to be more effective. Because you know climate change is upon us. We as you know native you know people really feel that impact more than more than the the state side more than the other you know country uh, i mean the rest of the country you know we're we're having a hard time as it is and with this with the weather you know changing on us we need to uh move down this here path quickly and together unify and start moving down together so vila wopilai chicha below i thank you very much please visit us thank you all aho Thank you. Thank you, Henry. Excellent presentation. Um, uh, to our audience, I, I apologize. I'm not sure that the audio from our videos are coming through. Um, please send us a chat if you um, if you are getting audio. That way we know it, it's working, but it certainly isn't working for some of us. Um, with that, we'll, we're going to bring up uh, Chantel Green's slides, and we're having some <laughs> some uh, connection issues there as well. So uh, uh, please uh, bear with us if, if, if uh, Chantel and I need to coordinate some things. But Chantel, we're, we're still standing by here waiting for your slides to get up. As soon as your slides are posted here, I'll, I'll let you know. Okay, great. Uh, thank you. Um, I actually did figure out um, on, on my end to be able to log in so I can actually see the slides. And it works out better oh. than I can, I'm connected to the phone yet, so you can hear a little bit more clear. Excellent, excellent. Thanks, thanks, Chantel. Your slides are up, so you're you're ready to roll. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, again, my name is Chantel Green. I'm a member of the Nesper's Tribe, I'm a former vice chairman 
Um, and uh, what I'd like to share as of right now, and, and I'm honored to be able to follow uh, Henry, um, I guess just a little bit about myself. Um, I was actually a student um, coming through. I spent the summer in Pine Ridge Reservation. Um, my original homeland is in Idaho, um, Lafway, where we're located at. Um, and I came through about 2013 and uh, 14, um, learning with uh, the University of Colorado Boulder on a research and uh, sustainable engineering uh, program, uh, learning about solar and sustainable engineering. Um, and I was able to meet uh, Nick uh, Chilton and some other folks that's on the Primers Reservation. Um, so um, moving forward, um, learning what I've learned, um, you know, from my education, I was able to, uh, I guess, lead and collaborate and partner uh, with folks, um, especially with our, what Henry just mentioned, our climate change. Um, we need to move that quick, fast, and in a hurry, and a lot faster than said we have been. Um, so that brings us to uh, my presentation here. Uh, this is Mesker Solar and Energy Initiative. You can go ahead and go to the next slide. So here uh, with this project, um, our first, uh, you know, our mission, um, our climate change and energy development, uh, we'll go to our history, our purpose and the decisions made um, to our uh, project. Uh, steps or Revolution, a company that we work with out of Macaw, Idaho, uh, to pre-construction and the requirements that it took. Some of our project stages that we kind of laid out from the beginning, from phase one, two, um, and then looking to needing to develop and expand the future sustainability of, of this project and solar energy. Our project goals and outcome with the resiliency through energy independence and energy cost reduction, and then providing renewable energy to our area. Um, and then we will get to the industry, women of solar, and workforce development. Um, and you can go ahead and go to the next slide. Okay, and with this, our mission uh, for the first tribe, um, our climate change and energy subcommittee was formulated in the spring of 2019. Um, and this serves to address climate change and natural resources issues, promote eco justice, mitigation strategies energy consumption, energy development, environmental health, workforce development, and all efforts to take the tribe to being greener, utilizing sustainable methodologies, having sustainable solutions for and on behalf of the next first tribe. Uh, now with our climate change and energy subcommittee, uh, yeah, this is our brand new subcommittee. Uh, no other um, subcommittees have actually been created for our tribe before. Um, I guess to help move that along, um, I guess, one part about myself is I was actually on council um, at this time, um, just utilizing my background um, in environmental justice um, to, you know, educate and, and work with our council members that this is a direction that we really needed to take and start being a little bit more focused on climate change and energy development and how that ties in with economic development. Um, at the time, I believe it was the, the vice chairman, um, and, and I'm really appreciative that our council uh, was willing to move and get educated in this, and, and you know we're entrenched with our traditional ecological knowledges, and, and they were willing to to move forward and acknowledging that yeah we do need a little bit be a little bit more focused and, and start getting um, a little bit more uh, up front with our climate change and energy um, effort. Uh, you can go to the next slide, please. Um, here, um, this was in 2020. Our history was our, our council uh, decision to invest in renewable energy and workforce development. Uh, with that, a resolution was passed out of our climate change and energy subcommittee to our whole NEPSIC. And this is the NEPSIC uh, tribe executive committee. And this is a ratifying meeting that we have to go through this process. Um, and that allowed us to get on the beginning of our solar journey to energy independence. Go ahead and go to the next slide, please. Our purpose, again, um, here seeking true sustainability and resiliency by becoming energy independent through the deployment of solar power and storage due to the manufacture of light commercial and residential scale systems. Um, and what I learned, again, kind of coming from the University of Colorado Boulder, um, the Red Cloud, uh, solar and uh, renewable energy, um, I was taught about service learning. Um, 
following that shoot, we were able to create workforce training and development for tribal members in all facets of renewable energy education to include design, engineering, installations of solar panels and energy storage. Uh, while promoting renewable energy, and like you're gonna probably hear uh, most of today, is that partnership of collaboration efforts to offset usage of hydropower. Um, that's very important um, to our people across the nation and doing what we can on our part to, to answer um, those health and human uh, services criteria to actually remove dams um, and, and kind of transition us from hydropower. Uh, so you can go ahead and go to the next slide, please. Here, uh, with our project, these are the steps that we took. Um, you know, if you are a council member or if you're looking to get into uh, solar renewable energy, um, for us, this is the steps that we needed to take. Um, the Nest First Tribe Energy Initiative was passed and approved. Uh, solar resolution to enter into a power purchase agreement. Um, with Revolution LLC, cleaner, smarter energy to develop solar energy systems. Uh, with this, we created a mini micro grid uh, based on our budget on the design and cost, which matches the purpose. Um, we identified funding sources, and then we went over our utility billing, and then that brought us to the beginning to uh, pre-construction requirements and then to our start date. Um, you can go ahead and go to the next slide. Uh, this is uh, photos of our new uh, solar system. Here we created a mini microgrid solar system. Uh, there were three sites that was selected for initial deployment of photovoltaic solar PV arrays that had easily accessible rooftops allowing for rapid solar arrays and totaling uh, 307 kilowatts. And we installed 778 panels um, of installed PV. The sites that we selected that you see here, one of them is the administration building and community center. Uh, we found out that those are tied into the same uh, same system. And then we also selected, which is a high energy consumer, which is our wastewater treatment plant, um, and then our Boys and Girls Club building. Okay, go ahead and go to the next slide. This was the budget for this project that we uh, was able to get the funding for. Um, so with our power purchase agreement, um, and there was a lot of reasoning for that as well. I know there's a lot of things to actually learn uh, when tribes are actually get into, uh, you know, doing projects like this. Um, the difference between purchasing out and then power purchase agreement. Um, with this, it allowed us to actually, while it's new to our area, we don't actually have solar in our area. Um, so being able to work um, with the company Revolution, who has been helping guide us um, along the way, um, it's been, you know, a, a, a really educational experience, um, and this allowed us to work with them for the next five years while we're installing and learning all at the same time. This is a learning experience, not just for the community, not just the tribal members that were hired um, to learn um, solar installation, but also for our council and, and everybody, our utility um, companies as well. Um, that's the scale that we went. Um, they, you know, it, we had had to go through these learning curves, and um, all in all, it, it's been it's been a great thing. So this was our budget. Um, this is one point, uh, almost close to one point five million dollar project. Um, as you can see at the bottom there, we are well over uh, two hundred sixty seven thousand for our employees, um, and that's just um, an investment that went back right back into our community uh, that supported our tribal members. Uh, workforce development, training and learning, and uh, eventually being certified. Other funding sources are the CARES funding uh, was utilized for this project. Grants are available through state federal organizations like Grid Alternatives and other investors and loan options. And you can go ahead and go to the next slide. Um, here, some of our main requirements that we had to go through as a tribe. Um, some tribes do and some tribes don't, but we do have a CARO uh, program. Um, this is where so we had to get through our CARO compliance and pre-construction meeting. Uh, that brought us to our tribal, uh, those are our tribal uh, requirements. Uh, and then our requirement two uh, with revolution, um, utility agreements, ordering and final assessment, they have their own requirements as, as a business. And then our requirement three brought us to our subcontract craft subcontracting as an electrical work. Uh, you can go ahead and go to the next slide. 
um, here. Uh, this was our very beginning in 2020, uh, right in the middle of the pandemic. Um, we began in September, I believe September 11th, uh, was our first day uh, beginning of our work site. Um, we did our pre-construction meeting that was set with Arrow uh, for our compliance requirements. Uh, we went through the recruitment uh, that brought us to our start date in the beginning of site work. Uh, by October, uh, we predicted 18, and after our first month, uh, we exceeded predictions with 38 new tribal members learning solar installation. By November, our solar panels were laid and starting electrical work. Um, our current numbers now we're at 50, and we had to create a waiting list. Um, December, uh, our project was almost complete, and we were starting into two phase two. Uh, go ahead and go to the next slide, please. Um, here, this explains our project stages, and uh, while we're finishing up phase one, which is our first initial project, uh, microgrid, which we had looked to gain support and inspire for future projects, uh, that is now complete. Uh, we are working through phase two, which is developing a net zero comprehensive document that helps the tribe with mitigation strategies and action plans that does involve solar and renewable energy. Uh, looking to the future and our future development, uh, we would like to develop a uh, next first energy department of energy to maintain future projects uh, so that we can continue workforce training and development and STEM, uh, STEM learning. Uh, you can go ahead and go to the next slide, please. Here, our project goals and outcome. Uh, this is uh, part of our Houston morning trivia. This can be looked up. Uh, but this, uh, they were present with us when we actually did uh, start our, um, turn on our, I guess, our solar system. So the next first tribe switched on 778 solar panels. The first step into a effort to fight climate change and move toward energy independence. Uh, and so the accumulation, so this is um, 2020, our energy costs for the buildings that were selected. Our admin building in our Pine Bluff Community Center uh, was costing us um, close to a little bit over 5000 Our wastewater treatment plant was close to 2200 and our Boys and Girls Club was about $1,600. Um, we are looking to continue collection of data to get a true counting of the reduction and eventually our uh, storage amount uh, for 2022 to see uh, the reduced energy costs for our tribe. Uh, if you go ahead and go to the next slide. And here uh, we have some of the questions, um, and we are still also collecting data for this uh, to really see the true impact uh, that our first solar project made to our tribe. Um, here uh, we have some questions to our tribal employee rights office. Um, how many new participants uh, did we bring to Terrell? Um, that was 30, 35, and only one had solar experience. So this was 35 new people that we brought um, to Terrell. Um, how many were women? Uh, we added eight new women um, to the industry, and how many are Terrell waitlist? Uh, I believe currently, um, or they were um, 16. I uh, go ahead and go to the next slide, please. So yes, women of solar. Um, this includes uh, justice, equality, diversity, and inclusion. Um, this is a great thing. Um, and it was actually a new thing, uh, as we don't really typically have a lot of women come into Tarot. So with this first project, we were able to add eight women to the solar industry with this first project. Um, that's, that's, a, that's a wonderful thing to, to happen. I know one of the individuals is actually looking uh, you know, to develop their own, own business, and that's really what we're really encouraging and trying to get behind, um, especially these installers that have learned already to go ahead and, and that helps the tribe and our area grow and prosper um, through their own success, uh, getting fuller certified and creating their own businesses out of it. That's uh, definitely what we're highly promoting here. Um, you can go ahead and go to the next slide. Um, here, um, I definitely wanted to highlight some of our, our eternal programs. Um, again, similar to like our zero programs, there's some, uh, there's some tribes that do and there's some tribes that don't have uh, our tarot, and there are some tribes that don't have a 477 program. Um, we definitely are trying to work and collaborate with our 477 program and certification. 
Um, and here is the purpose um, of a 477 program. So if your tribe does not have a 477 program, um, this is some information that it is definitely encouraged to go ahead and go forward um, with developing that. Um, ours is placed underneath our education uh, department. So this is the Indian Employment Training and Related Services Administration Act for your 477. Um, and there are uh, several advantages, um, and the a lot of the purposes are improved client services that increase the number of clients they serve and improve outcomes for clients, bettering utilization of program staff, counseling staff can service clients based on client needs, not based on where the money or their salaries originated from, client staff can focus on providing services to clients who need them, basically tribal members, um, how our 477 program helps our solar and uh, and sellers and increasing participation numbers to our program. This is through education, employment training, and supportive services. Activities are used to reduce barriers and enable uh, eligible participants to work towards achieving self-sufficiency. And it also supports job creation and provides opportunities. And with this risk project, we were able to provide uh, to the program and to uh, the community 26 new participants. Uh, go ahead and go to the next slide, please. Uh, so through this first project, um, working through phase two um, of our project here in the energy and solar, this is our solar training and certification course progress. Now we, uh, so our OSHA 10 and RE have been completed for our current indigenous solar employees and on the job trainees continue through uh, installation, sales, service, and maintenance. Uh, we are creating a training uh, program uh, with the National Board of Certified Energy uh, energy practitioners, the FAFSEP, solar certification for continued education, uh, working with the Lewis Clark uh, State College, work training and development, um, and creating a specialized curriculum career path. And now we have actually already completed that. We have currently three uh, solar uh, training tracks that you can assist out of. Um, and right now, where we're at with that is we are, because we don't have solar in the area, we are actually uh, working with uh, LCSC Workforce Training Development to identify a certified uh, instructor, and then we will be able to provide these courses to the entire area. This is both non-tribal and tribal. Uh, We're also working with the Bonneville Environmental Foundation, um, and this will be um, more continued education, uh, K-12 renewable education that will also utilize the career pathway into solar and energy coaching curriculum. And you can go ahead and go to the next slide, please. Uh, some information that we like to share, um, utilizing the green economy uh, methodology um, here, 70% new wind and solar uh, make up our U.S. generated capacity in 2021, um, and we are looking to connect our, our other projects, such as uh, agriculture, uh, our development of a, a winery and grapes, um, and then hemp cultivation. Uh, we have a new USDA. Uh, approved plan uh, for the tribe, and we're looking to grow our capacity to open that up um, here shortly for uh, individual tribal members, owner operators, uh, business opportunity for individual tribal members to um, have their own individual businesses how to use hemp and agriculture, and then looking to apply um, our solar and sustainable engineering to new infrastructure. Uh, we have the dam removal or breaching goal, which is 5,311. Um, and then looking to do 50% less uh, consumption um, of uh, gas, and we're looking to do electrification. Uh, now our, our casino has already transitioned over to um, having two hard charging stations and looking to install at our, our other casino. Um, and then we're hoping to be able to get the money to be able to continue on that path um, with electrification. Uh, here, our battery storage capacity is set to quadruple over the next year. Um, this is according to the U.S. Energy Information Administration, um, expecting to add 4.3 gigawatts. Uh, two thirds of new solar projects are now built in tandem with energy storage like ours um, that we completed here. And at the current rate, wind, solar, and storage could overtake conventional technology as a living source of generation by the early 20s. I need you to go ahead and go to the next slide, please. Solar systems. What happens when partnership and collaboration come together? 
You can go to the next slide, please. Solar success. Solar system success. Our solar army created the foundation. Uh, and the photo here is actually some of our tribal members uh, who are working with uh, conduit and wiring up um, some of our solar system. Um, with this project, uh, the service learning was utilized. Uh, tribal resiliency was created. Dam removal or breaching uh, was promoted. Dam and recovery promoted. Ecotourism promoted. And green economy also promoted. We're going to go ahead and go to the next slide. I believe this is where we start our first uh, video, um, where you get to hear uh, directly from some of our uh, solar instructors and some of the folks from Revolution um, and Stephanie Sands, our climate change coordinator, and some of our partners um, that help move this project along. Uh, so you'll be able to hear from them. Somebody commented that when Lewis and Clark first came here, they said the fish were so thick in the river that they could almost walk across the river on the backs of the fish. I would love to see our salmon back like that. And my name is Chantel Green. I am the former vice chairman of the Nespers Tribe Executive Committee. We had originally started out with um, a partnership actually between myself um, and the climate change coordinator, Stephanie Krantz. When I first started this job, the tribe had just been through this horrible drought and fish kill and wildfire situation. One of the first things that we did was do surveys to understand what the community really wanted. The number one thing that people said that they wanted was renewable energy. And the number two thing that they said was they wanted protection for water and education. Yeah, so Stephanie Kranz and I were involved in a uh, smart energy group program headquartered in Boise, Idaho. And we were sitting in our umpteenth meeting for the year uh, with this group and other groups and going in and out of governor's offices and senator's offices and we realized it was just a lot of meetings and a lot of talk. And I texted her in the middle of the meeting and I said, are you tired of talking? And she said, yes. And I said, let's make something happen. It is hard to understate the impacts of climate change to tribal members. It impacts salmon and the Nimipu are salmon people. Within a week, we were sitting down with uh, Chantel Green, the vice chairman of the tribe. The partnership developed into the direction that we decided to take for solar energy. We're gonna act, we're tired of talking, and let's put some panels on some roofs. One of our goals when we came here was to hire tribal members to do the installation to hire all tribal staff to do the work, to build the capacity here to do more solar projects, having meaningful work where they're doing something about a problem that's affecting the things that they care about the most is really healing. My name is Vernon Holt. I lived in Lapway, Chief almost all my life. Well, at first, I didn't want to do it because I'm kind of afraid of heights, but I started getting used to it, and then after that, I just started flying through it. And I was in, actually in the mountains hunting, and my, my uncle called me. He's like, get down here. Uh, he's like, last day they're hiring, so I drove down here and got the job. But I was a draft drafter before, so I did designs for um, solar in the past. I came out here kind of expecting to be on a labor job, um, but I found out that I was actually being trained for any profession I wanted in solar panel industry. I actually wanted to start my own business and a friend sent me an email 
that they were looking for people to do solar install. So I'd figure I'd try it out and before I actually went to school for it, see if I liked it. I was uh, excited to be here every day on the job and it seems like every day we've kind of are learning something new out here. I'd like to see panels on homes and be free from all this uh, financials. When I got on on the project, it, I really uh, bought on to the project manager's vision and because I also advocate for dam removal. On I love the idea of, you know, going green and uh, clean renewable energy, which is, you know, the future is going to be anyway, so you might as well get on it now. The best case scenario, as far as I'm concerned, is if the tribe was not only self-sufficient, but that they could um, have their own utility company. Hopefully expect some more training, more education, and, and more panels to put up. I hope that we do end up starting a company and there'll be more employment for people here on the reservation. It's definitely worthwhile, I mean, but just going off our own power, I, I like that. It would be a bigger income than the casino and that income fluctuates. If we had our own electrical company, that income wouldn't fluctuate and it would be huge for the tribe and all the tribal members. This is something that I see the tribe setting precedent for, for other tribes to do as well as renewable energy and taking our power back. It's, it's good that we're outside working, but the other part, you know, we're actually doing something good for the environment, for our people. Um, and yeah, if the jobs keep coming in, I would definitely stick with it. And I'd encourage other people to get into it too. It could also help with bringing back the fish, which is important to our cultural beliefs. We'd like to put in many, many panels and bring back many, many salmon. It uh, is long overdue that the tribe could take a leadership role in, uh, in providing an alternative energy source to uh, replace hydropower, because that's what we're fighting now. If they could just see the vision of where this can go, the opportunity, you know, I, I would like to see that people get invested in it emotionally, not just financially, and back it. And even if it takes time, like it took years to go from the tent to building the, the new casino and the lodge, it could take years, but don't let it go. The opportunity is too huge. Uh, getting other tribes and other, other local economies to uh, switch over their uh, energy source will take time. It's not going to happen overnight, so. You do have the right partnerships and collaborations moving forward. That's where you can see these projects come into fruition. And now we are going to be the leading um, in energy storage and development um, on behalf of our tribes here in Idaho. Um, thank you. Uh, we can go ahead and go to our next slide. Oh, that's somebody else's. <laughs> okay, and this will bring us to our last video. Uh, this is a mega finish. You can go ahead and bring up the next video.
we have been told today that this is the first Tesla pack in the state of Idaho and possibly the Northwest. And it is such uh, an experience that the Nefers tribe is the, the one that brought this to Idaho and is the first to experience a Tesla power pack. The goal of this project is to give them autonomy uh, with their own energy system, both solar energy and battery storage. About a year ago, really just thought it was a, a job, you know, just to uh, pay some bills, but I, I like what I'm doing and I feel good about what I'm doing. Today is such a, a totally amazing experience. I am so glad that I was here and experienced this and looking forward to the future of solar energy with Nestor's Tribe. Great, go ahead and go to the next slide, please. Great, and with all of that, what we are working on now. Um, we are moving forward with solar projects. Uh, we are looking to our next uh, prioritized uh, solar project, which will be our solar and the enterprise. So our enterprise, um, which is our casino and our golf course, uh, we are set uh, for our pre-assessment uh, dated November 5th, um, and we will be. We have been working with the enterprise team to actually look at the assessment or rooftop um, going over your utility billing, and then we'll be able to come up with the design posture shortly and be able to provide resiliency um, to our uh, casinos. Uh, with this, this is really built off of resiliency. Um, Due to the pandemic, uh, you know we we did uh, face a lot of uh, of loss economics. Um, if, if any tribe that does have a casino and it's based on um, in, you know what the funding provides for programs, that's what a lot of people don't actually realize is that our casino's purpose is to actually provide funding uh, toward uh, our programs, the services that we provide to our tribal members. Uh, and we, we took great losses to our enterprises. So we're looking to help help out our enterprises as of right now through our renewable energy and our solar projects um, and looking to cut their costs and help them um, you know, at any, any corner that they can to gain economic back for, for our tribe and our tribal members. Um, simultaneously, working on our fisheries uh, and our cherry lane hatchery, uh, our Joseph Oregon offices are next. Um, and we are looking for dates to be set currently uh, for our free assessment um, for those offices. Uh, we will also be partnering. As of right now, we're moving through uh, a partnership that we will be bringing forward shortly. We will be doing recruitment uh, for Community Rebuild. This is a sustainable engineering uh, community rebuild partnership, STEM education, and building workforce training and development. Uh, this is the same type of model that we utilize for the solar project and getting our tribal members trained. Uh, instead of doing it during the project, we will actually be doing the training. Um, this is a, a learning opportunity um, that is provided, uh, that provides training opportunity, workforce training and development, um, a career pathway uh, with community rebuild to hands on learning, education for individual tribal members, internships, and apprenticeships. This, we will be doing a free placement filling of uh, looking for 16 beds. Um, uh, one semester. Uh, semesters are August to December and then February to June, and we will be coordinating that with uh, Ricky Epperson, uh, the Executive Director of Community Rebuild currently. Uh, our purpose here is to be able to provide uh, free education to tribal members, free housing during the semester, uh, food, and a stipend. Uh, this will be located and we will be taking our tribal members to Moab, Utah, um, and then with the intent to be able to come back uh, with our learning and education to construct and manage um, for uh, a pilot project uh, looking to address our housing uh, our housing shortage within the reservation um, and be able to build and construct uh, straw bale constructions with uh, renewable uh, materials from the ground up. Um, 
And then, um, again, in alignment with our goals here, uh, reduce CO2 emissions. Uh, the 2016 uh, dam removal or breaching number uh, from BPA, and that's where we specified 1,311 megawatts of solar, and this constitutes to 2.14 billion solar panels installed. Doing our part, uh, the net zero energy efficiency plan is currently being developed uh, that is underway uh, right now. Uh, the next bridge energy department creation, this is to sustain future growth and to build up the capacity to um, expand the projects uh, and then build partnerships and, and expand. Um, you can go ahead and go to the next slide. Uh, these are the credits um, uh, that help uh, through this uh, throughout this project. Um, you know, there's the Delta Nets first tribe and our council moving forward and accepting uh, to move in the direction of renewable energy. A big thanks to, to them, um, our solar indigenous installers. Uh, Revolution, uh, Stephanie Trant, um, and uh, you know the community. Um, we're looking to be able to continue continue this forward. Um, and you can go ahead and go to the next uh, slide. And this brings us uh, to the end of my presentation. Uh, I want to thank everybody. Um, I also wanted to thank uh, Rafaela working with the Bonneville Environmental Foundation, moving us forward with renewable energy. It's been a great partnership so far as well. Revolution, um, and then for more information um, on our solar project, um, and our order partner, um, and or how, how we achieve what we, we could from the council level. Um, feel free to reach out to Nestor's Tribe Executive Direction, uh, where I am located right now. Uh, my information is provided here. Um, yeah, so, uh, thank you very much. Thanks so much, Chantel, and we are getting some questions. Um, as a reminder to the audience, we're going to take all the questions at the end. Um, excellent presentation, Chantel. What a, what a wonderful group or bunch of projects and initiatives you're working on. Thanks for sharing that information with us. Um, now we'll move on to our second to last presentation from uh, Blackfeet Community College. Uh, Melissa and Tim, looks like your slides are up. Go ahead. Good morning, good, good afternoon, uh, hello and thank you. My name is Tim Willink, I'm director of the tribal program at Grid Alternatives. I'll go ahead and turn it over to Melissa to introduce herself. Um, and this is just a case study for, uh, work on the Blackfeet Community College and our workforce development training. Um, go ahead, Melissa, maybe you wanna just, after your intro, take it from there to talk about uh, how this um, project fit in with the, the mission of the college and workforce development. Okay, I'm just going to talk um, okay, everybody, um, thank you for inviting us to present on today's webinar. Um, I'm, my name is Melissa Weatherwax. I'm the Director of Institutional Development. Um, you may hear some background ground noise. Um, today we have high winds. Um, and so, but what, how, what I kind of wanted to mention today about our um, mission here at Blackfeet Community College is to um, promote um, promote meaningful employment is one of our um, core themes in um, accomplishing working towards our mission. Our project is um, a bit smaller than the regular um, Department of Energy projects is where a tribal college as um, an entity of the tribe but chartered by the Blackfeet tribe. Um, when we we worked on the kind of plan project for about two years and we actually partnered with Heart Butte Schools, which is a um, state entity, Heart Butte Public Schools. Um, and after we got into um, fundraising and um, um, working towards completing a solar project here um, on campus, we um, kind of had to dwindle it down to being able to partner and pulling together several money um, money funding sources to accomplish both projects. I kind of wanted to mention the wind as uh, Blackfeet Community College has 
um, worked on energy since about the late 90s, early 2000s. Um, we had an off-grid um, greenhouse system here for our extension, our USDA extension program. We had a have a, a lead platinum facility here. And so this project was to try to keep the workforce training going and um, keep the um, solar platform here going on campus as well as being a demonstration and example to the rest of um, the reservation and hopefully um, tribal government, tribal partners. Um, we did kind of dabble in wind um, at one time. And so what um, kind of came from learning in the past, and that was was that um, we needed the workforce to be able to maintain this um, technology. Um, and when we went to um, to the DOE conference program reviews, we were actually looking for um, looking for what our options were as far as um, developing and designing new facilities here on campus. And when we um, when we the more we learned, we kind of like to um, hone in on the um, net zero um, concept and implementing that here on campus and helping students, um, which you'll hear from later. Um, entering into those um, that workforce and accessing that training so that we can um, will have um, leadership and skills to draw from in the future as the tribe develops more. So that's kind of all I wanted to add as far as the introduction and the um, conception of the project. Thank you, Melissa. Um, next slide, please. And this is just our partnership with our program. And um, I think it's one of the entrances to the Blackfeet Nation. Um, and I also just want to take a moment to thank Lizana and her team for all their support and asking us to be a part of it today in these presentations. Um, and also her, Melissa uh, and Black and Black Nation partners, um, as well as all of our other uh, partners. Um, and I also want to honor and really thank the other presenters. I think it's amazing uh, the work that we all are doing. Um, next slide, please. Again, this is our program um, since 2010. Um, we've partnered with over 50 tribal communities and indigenous nations across the United States to achieve their renewable energy goals. Um, we are You know, not A to Z, but I feel like we're pretty close as far as having the conversation, working with tribes vision and goals for solar PV installation um, and developing those projects and then seeking funding um, and then implementing. Um, and what differentiates us again is uh, probably we're a nonprofit um, that incorporates hands-on uh, training and education on the installation um, and working with our partners on those. Um, this is a photo from the Heart Butte um, project uh, at the high school. These are mainly high school students. They were chosen by the Heart Butte School. Uh, we're doing 160 kilowatt ground mount um, right near their high school. Uh, and again, they are all putting in racking for that project. Um, next slide, please. Again, a little background is the Blackfeet Indian Reservation is located in Northwest Montana bordering the Canadian border and home to 17,000 tribal members. Um, this is our photo of our partnership with the college. These are three of the four buildings where we started in, where we installed. Um, these are very prominent on their campus, about 53 uh, kilowatts DC. Um, and part of that was to hire and train um, uh, college students there uh, to be part of the installs. Um, it was a very rewarding experience um, working with them um, and a lot of learning and process. And again, based on our previous slide, part of the training was remote training. Um, we did classroom work with them. Um, we had, uh, they went through and got their OSHA 10 certifications in construction and safety. Um, and also we are, in order to get them ready for the job, uh, market. They were also given um, hard hats, safety vests, and we also um, paid a portion of 
get them getting their steel toe boots. So if they move on to solar, uh, to the solar industry, then they'll be able to um, not have to do those upfront costs. So that's part of our um, training, but then also, you know, you see in our photos, everybody's in fall protection um, and really the construction standard for uh, safety standards for installation. Next slide, please. Again, about 30 miles away, half an hour away is Heartbeat, Montana. Uh, these are, again, photos from um, the high school. And we identified a number of high school students, seven students total, a number of women uh, installing on uh, the ground mount. Next slide, please. Again, as I mentioned, we had some online training. Um, Three hour live presentations through Google Classroom with quizzes. Uh, you know, talked about grid alternatives, but also safety basics, solar and solar PV 101, uh, energy efficiency weatherization, a little bit of policy and net metering, again, as it relates to their own utilities within their areas. Um, you know, some very basics on the makeup of off grid systems. Um, we will also work on soft skills. In the job market, uh, making sure you're communicating with your supervisors um, and and learning and asking questions and things like that. Um, employment readiness and again OSHA 10 certification. Next slide, please. Week two is our classroom on the roof, um, where we were. Um, participating on the hands-on portion of installation. These are photos of students. Uh, every morning beforehand, we circle up, we do scope of work, we do um, safety talk and identifying um, potential hazards for the day during that scope. And again, everybody's in fall protection harnesses, hard hats and safety vests, uh, and making sure we're all um, you know, complying, if not exceeding safety standards on the job site. Next slide, please. Uh, we will have Thelma Wall talk right now about her experiences. Um, she's from uh, uh, the Blackfeet Nation, uh, BCC student. I kind of gave her a little nickname recently. I, I, I call her Two-Step Thelma. I feel like she's always two steps ahead of, of us. Uh, you ask her, hey, we need to get this tool. And she's like, I already got it. I'm ready to go. So she's with us now as a um, temporary project-based installer working with us. So I'll just let Thelma introduce herself and talk a little bit about her experience. My name is Thelma Wall. I am from the Blackfeet Nation, but I am also from the Lummi Nation. My first project was in Art Heartbeat. Um, I am now on my third. I'm really excited to work with GRID. I've been learning new things almost every day now. Um, my goal with GRID was just to learn more about, um, so I'm going into engineering, preferably environmental if I can. So I kind of thought it helped me get into that direction. Um, I think that's it. Great, thank you, Stelma. Uh, again, she's in these photos, um, you know, putting in the supports for the system, doing a lot of racking, and then actually installing um, the modules in the photo down below on the right on the Rosebud Nation on a project there. Uh, next slide, please. And I'll let Jaden take it away. Uh, he gave me a kind of reality check yesterday um, when we were talking about the 80s where I graduated from, when I graduated from high school and he said yeah I, I heard about the 80s uh, my history teacher taught us introduced us to, to that in, in class but he's just, just a recent graduate from high, high school um, and I'll just let Jaden introduce himself and talk about some of his experiences as well okay any students uh, Jade. Hello, everyone. My name is Jaden from that night. I recently graduated from Heartbeat High School this past April. I ended up hearing about great alternatives coming to Heartbeat through my superintendent and counselor. They picked me for the training and they thought it would be best for me to do. So I 
decided to do the training and now I love the job. I love the traveling. I love the work. And I've had an uncle that worked in renewable energy before. He was a wind, wind turbine worker. And that's what kind of got me into it. And I hope to stay in the solar business for a long time. And I hope to be able to work with grid for a while too. But that's what my goal is as right now is to stay with the solar business. Great, thank you, Jaden. Um, yeah, some of these photos are, the one on the top right is us, we're again working at, on Jaden's own high school, uh, at Hartview High School installing. The bottom right is where we installed some central inverters uh, for the Rosebud uh, project. Um, and again, you know, Jaden's been great and uh, showing up on time, uh, staying late if he has to, always asking questions and developing his skill set. Um, again, always really safe with his hard hat. Uh, as you can see, there's some, on some of these ground mounts, there's other equipment such as uh, heavy machinery and stuff. Um, we're hoping to look to see, uh, see if you can encourage him to get some of those certifications as well as Thelma um, so that she's ready also uh, and gets that experience, experience and skill development. Um, next slide, please. Again, there's just a couple more photos. This is recent here, uh, working. This is Thelma uh, practicing bending conduit bending for um, to install between inverters um, and up on the roof. Um, she's been doing really well with that. But again, I think she's just uh, been, you know, again safety compliant, working really really hard, uh, being willing to travel, always on time, um, and uh, just you know, gonna be a leader in the future if she chooses to go that route, but I have no doubt that she's gonna use this experience um, to either further her education um, it for an engineering degree or else hopefully, fingers crossed, that she's still with us uh, installing um, for a, a bit of time to come. Next slide, please. And again, uh, this is Jaden up on the roof um on a residence he's doing a wire pull uh um to the j box um which is pretty technical but um i think he's developed developed a skill set in that and very safe and very conscientious very efficient um and just uh really neat and takes pride in his workmanship for sure both of them do so it's super exciting to see him you know, this is the type of experience that grid alternatives provides again as a classroom on the roof um, and uh, again you know we're super excited to have him and Thelma on our team um, as we continue installations throughout the country um, through, uh, in the months to come um, next slide please again we want to thank all the folks who are involved with this project the Department of Energy all the trainees, um, uh, Blackfeet Community College, Bonville Environmental Fund, and Rafaela uh, Hartview Schools, and Mike Katzi, the supervisor, superintendent, the community, uh, TSAF, the Tribal Solar Accelerator Fund, and First Interstate Bank. Um, it definitely was a, a lot of partners involved to pull off these projects, um, a lot of coordination, but um, and it's very challenging projects, um, but very also very rewarding and very impactful. Next slide, please. Oh, we're waiting for questions at the end. I apologize for this one. Uh, I just want to open up to see if Melissa had anything else to add on the partnership or uh, um, the projects themselves or any of the students. Um, no, I have, I don't have anything to add at this time, but um, just thankful that the students are, are engaged and kept um, going and um, are seeking out for their training and experience to, um, to build their um, pathways with that was kind of the end goal is that we were able to introduce our high school through um, co tribal college students and um, hopefully we'll have a NAPSEP certification here on the ground. So thank you everybody. And thank you for inviting us to do the webinar. Yep. 
and thank you everybody and thanks james and everybody and um we'll stay on for questions later sounds good yeah thanks tim thanks melissa Velma, and Jaden. um we'll move on to our last presentation now uh peyton we'll pull your slides up here they are and uh looks like we're just a couple minutes behind schedule so more or less uh 15 minutes is what you got thanks peyton bye you got it. Thank you, James. Um, wow, a lot of amazing, amazing project, amazing work going on out there in Indian country. And here I am, the, the boring Fed, to talk about our our programs. Um, thank you, Lazana and James, for inviting me to speak. I really appreciate the opportunity to be a part of your webinar series here. Um, can you skip ahead two slides, please? Because we already covered my bio and, and everything about me. Um, a little bit about our office. We're the Division of Energy and Mineral Development, DEMD. Um, in April, we were moved under the BIA, Bureau of Indian Affairs, Office of Trust Services. So here's our org chart as it stands now, just so you know where we sit in the uh, federal government um, framework here. We often get confused with DOE uh, and Lazana shop over there. Uh, we are totally separate under DOI, not DOE, Department of Interior. So. Um, we are two separate groups, even though we work, you know, hand in hand on a lot of these energy projects. Um, and, you know, I, I think our grant programs and our technical assistance programs cross service a lot of these tribal um, energy development pr uh, projects. So, um, you know, we, we love to, to interact with each other and, and make sure that we're coordinating our services to, to best fit Indian country and the de energy development efforts that, that tribes want to take on. Um, so next slide, please. So our mission is to provide the best possible technical and economic advice um, in relation to energy and mineral development uh, to tribes throughout Indian country. Next, please. So our office is made up of six independent branches. Um, we have a branch of renewable and distributed generation, a fluid mineral branch, a solid mineral, mineral branch, a geotechnical and data services branch, um, NioGems, which is a mapping um, system that pulls information from a lot of databases out in Indian country um, so that we can kind of track what's, you know, what's going on in the oil, gas and leasing space and, and uh, also some surface activities. Um, and then we have the branch that I'm the acting branch chief of, which is the business services branch. And uh, my branch works across all of these groups to provide uh, strategic economic planning, financial and business structure advice. So next slide, please. So again, you know, my branch, we work really across all these branches. We are uh, an initial touch point for a lot of tribal projects when they're saying, hey, is this going to be financially feasible? Does this make sense? You know, should we apply for grants, loans, whatever it may be? Um, you can give our office a call, request technical assistance, and, and we can assist you in some initial project planning and scoping work. We also have a marketing department that assists tribes with um developing brochures and 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 a lot of uh uh kind of just marketing activities that that they need um next please so the the highlight here is that we have we have money that will be available once we have a budget i think all of us are in the federal government are sitting around waiting for for december to to see what's going to happen with these next budget uh bills and um, we're waiting. We have two grant programs that we issue annually um, for energy and mineral development. And um, they're called the EMDP and the TEDC. So a little bit of acronym soup, but if you throw those acronyms into uh, grants.gov, you'll find our programs and our solicitations. Um, so two grant programs available. And then we also offer technical assistance. Um, and you know we like to work with uh, the off the DOE Lizana shop and coordinate technical assistance a lot. Um, so you know if you're working on a tribal project and and you know you, you're right at the front end of it, please contact our office. Um, we like to, like I said before, be that initial touch point and and coordinate services. Um, next slide, please. So a little bit more about our grant programming. These numbers change annually, but last year for our EMDP grant, we gave away $6 million. And then for our TEDC grant, we gave away 1.5 million. So, you know, our programming is, is fairly small and it's very, very competitive. Um, 8.1 million uh, uh, 
and we we issue a, a ton of grants. We have a lot of active projects, over 200 active grant and technical assistance projects. Next, please. So you can see here's just a, a, a map display of where we're active. We're, we're all over the place, all over the country and Alaska. Um, and you can see this is delineated by our branches and our commodity groups. So we have projects under, under every single energy commodity um, out there. And you know we're looking into all of these things. So uh, that's probably good, thank you. Uh, next slide. So for workforce development, I just wanna highlight our TEDC grant program. And that's because this program is targeted to establish uh, business entity structures that are stabilized um, and, and can maintain the capacity to develop energy projects. So think about uh, establishing tribal utility authorities. That's one of the, the key activities that we award um, under this program. So I heard a little bit in Chantel's presentation about you know, what are the next steps? Do we wanna look into utility authority formation activities? Um, you know, how do we have this you know, sustainable energy development um, program really? Um, and I'll talk a little bit more about uh, utility authority development coming soon, but just know that our programs can, can um, fund some of the feasibility studies that are needed to look into creating these organizational structures. Um, we've been doing this since 2015, uh, awarded a lot of projects. Um, we're very small in the federal grant world, but you know we have a, we have a ton of active projects in this area. So next slide, please. Again, our TEDC grant program activities, eligible activities are, if you can think of it, we can probably fund some aspect of it as long as it has, you know, energy development and organizational and business formation as its, as its key components. Um, so it, again, we don't know when our FOA is going to come out pending our budget, but if you're, you're thinking about engaging in these activities, we invite you to contact us early um, and we can help you scope projects. So uh, next slide, please. So when we talk about our, our capacity development process, the C and the TEDC, um, just fundamentally what we're trying to do is, is get tribes from being passive and just paying your utility bill, right? Uh, I just get the bill every month and I pay it or it's on auto pay. Okay, let's get that bill, let's read it, let's, let's analyze who we're paying it to, why we're paying what we're paying. Um, then let's take a next step and get engaged and prioritize potential energy projects then get active in, in you know, actually deploying some of these energy projects, working with you know, off the Office of uh, Indian Energy, looking at their deployment programs, um, and then collaborate. So you know, getting tribes engaged and in, in presenting on panels like this and, and working with other tribes to develop energy projects. So next slide, please. And why focus on utility development? Um, when tribes go down this, you know, we, we've done probably 30 utility studies now. And what we find is that every tribe is different, but on average, tribes are spending two to $3 million per year on electric power. You know, that can be from, you know, a, a small tribe that spends a couple of hundred thousand dollars on power for their administrative buildings and, and housing projects, up to 20 million for, for large casino and resort tribes. Um, so if you extrapolate this market out to all of the, the 570 plus tribes, right, that are federally recognized, that's a one to two billion dollar annual market. So this market for just power sales is huge. Um, so the utility market on tribal lands is owned by third party incumbent utilities, not by tribes and tribal governments. So, and they may or may not have the best interest of the tribe in mind. So tribes need to and are. So there are tribal utilities out there that have, are, are currently operating and under development. And a lot of tribes that are doing excellent projects like we saw at Nez Perce, Pine Ridge. You know, there's a lot of these great examples out there now where tribes are taking a much more active role in managing these energy assets that are sitting on, the, on their lands. Um, next slide, please. So when we look into tribal youth utility uh, development, we break it down into four key components. And um, 
we analyze the energy infrastructure, we review and the legal and regulatory issues. And for workforce development, what we what we do a lot is we analyze the current capacity of the tribe, the business entity options that that tribe can select for either creating a utility or uh, energy department or whatever it may be. But the key here is owning those energy assets, the, the physical assets uh, and the the um, the jurisdiction rights, you know, to provide service on tribal lands. And then we also do a financial analysis. So I'm going to talk a little bit more, more about that. Um, next slide, please. So when you're looking at organizational options, the key here is stability. You want to create a stable business entity um, or, or you know, the division of the tribe, tribal utility authority that's capable of hiring and maintaining skilled workforce, right? So that's the key here. And tribes have a lot of different options. Um, you can do a federally chartered Section 17 corporation. You can have a tri tribally chartered corporation or LLC. You can be an unincorporated agency or division of the tribe, political subdivision or state law entity. So there's a ton of of organizational options that tribes should should look at and select which one works best for them. Um, next slide, please. And when I say what works best for you, what fits into the current tribal organizational chart? So one thing I think that a lot of tribes may overlook when they're developing energy projects is that they often have a lot of in-house capacity already, especially tribes that already operate um, water utilities, right? There's there's um, an understanding of how to, you know, maintain systems, do meter reading, uh, do billing and front office services, right? So um, uh, customer services. So it's critical that you analyze what's what is the tribe already doing, what's the current organizational framework of the tribe look like now, and how will a future energy utility fit into that existing organizational structure. Um, next slide, please. So one thing that the, the TEDC uh, grant program can pay for is a lot of this feasibility work. All right, let's break down what the tribe is doing currently, what are some of these missing um, capacity elements? And then I highlighted here at the bottom of this roadmap, which is a staffing plan. Do you need a general manager for this new utility um, do you need project management? Do you need grant writers? Do you need a clerk or customer service operations, right? And when is the appropriate time to hire them? So we break this out into a multi-year plan, identify what key initiatives there are that the tribe or that the tribe should look into when creating um, this utility business. And you know, who is going to do that and how much is it going to cost? Right. So um, that's some of the key work that we do in the TEDC is, is really kind of breaking down these utility projects into initiatives that are, you know, let's try to understand what the steps are here and who, who let's fill in the gaps with the appropriate staff to fill those, um, those capacity gaps. So next slide, please. And the final thing is, does it make financial sense? And in the world of uh, utility development tribes can have a full bricks and mortar utility with uh, linemen, service trucks. When the line goes down in the middle of the night, they're out there fixing it. All the way to let's just manage our billing a little bit better. Um, maybe throw some solar on a on a few rooftops behind the meter. Um, so there's a there's a large spectrum here, and analyzing the the financial uh, burden of each of those is critical. And so uh, we, we often take a really, really hard look at that too. So next slide, please. So again, just our grant programs, we can fund a lot of these activities. I know I'm at the end of my time here, my 15 minutes. Um, please look for these when they come out on grants.gov. Again, it probably won't be until we get a budget bill passed. Um, but if you're interested in these programs, if you're interested in technical assistance, please contact us. Uh, next slide, I think, has our contact information. Um, please feel free to send me an email. I will route you to the right contact in our office. Um, and I really appreciate the opportunity, James and Lazana, to present. And I hope I didn't bore everybody with uh, being the typical federal 
uh, presentation here. Um, and I'd just like to say great job to all the other presenters. Your, your projects are incredible and keep up the great work. So thank you so much. Thank you, Peyton, and thanks for uh, highlighting that there's other job opportunities, uh, workforce development opportunities outside of just uh, solar installations. So <laughs> it's, it's good to, to broaden the discussion a little bit. Um, uh, we'll now head over to uh, some Q&A, uh, but I did want to just let the audience know I just posted a, a, a link in the chat that um, will, if you click on the link, we'll, we'll bring you to where all of the slides are posted and currently available from today's presenters. So um, uh, you can pull those now or you can wait um, because you'll be getting an email notifying you that they're available um, in the next week or so. Anyways, uh, moving on to questions. Uh, first kind of a real, uh, kind of a, a good question for uh, uh, um, probably all of our solar related uh, presenters, but um, an individual here living in Oklahoma wants to get uh, get some training and get into the solar space. Um, is, are there recommendations on how he or they might be able to move forward and, and uh, get some training? Uh, hi, this is Chantel. Hey, are we just gonna go ahead and just start jumping into answering or? Yeah, yeah, please feel free to just, just chime in if you have uh, input. Okay, um, yeah, I had, um, I, I guess a few questions uh, for the individual if they wanted to do individually or are they looking for their tribe? Or are they looking to, to create a business or, or partner? Uh, those are some of the things that I, I think, it's think more, about. Yeah, it's more on the individual side. Um, they're interested in gaining skills and, and potentially starting a business. Um, yeah, I think um, obviously contacting any of the individuals that are on here um, for the alternatives individually would be, a, you know, a very good path. Um, Oklahoma, you can research um, if there are any uh, solar companies that are nearby and they'll typically they probably be open and can, some solar uh, companies can actually do their own in-house training. Uh, that if it's not provided in your area, then I would definitely look to um, you know some of the uh, the resources that you have here uh, to build up that capacity um, individually. Um, I know I I went through good alternatives myself um, at uh, around the same time, but I I went to uh, Henry Henry Red Cloud um, on the Pine Ridge, um, but I also did volunteer work, and that actually took me into uh, the direction. Um, that that our project and that's the shape of, but as they look to volunteer, uh, starting out in that direction with grid alternatives and, and learning installation, um, and then Denver, Colorado area. Um, so those are some good um, individual options. Thank you, Chantel, for the shout outs. This is Tim. Yeah, I would say that uh, this individual, they can go to our website or um, see my email on the slide there and shoot us an email. We will be posting a number of um, project-based installer positions. Travel is required, but um, we will have a number of projects uh, coming up. So just uh, feel free to get in contact with us. Thanks so much. Great, thank you both. Um, just following all, all along that line and thinking, um, what sort of physical requirements are there to, are typical for um, you know a solar-based installer? And then uh, you know job markets are often highly you know dependent on location. But can you give any idea on um, you know on a national level, uh, it, are the solar installer jobs in demand? I think if I can jump in here. Um... This is Tim again. Um, physical requirements are basically, you know, uh, being able to lift 50 pounds. Um, you know, we're hauling panels and modules up on the roof a lot, um, but just really willingness to learn um, and work hard and be a good teammate um, as far as, you know, folks we bring on. Um, and, uh, 
I would say the solar industry again is just going through the, the roof. There's gonna be a lot, a lot of opportunities. Um, um, you know, more and more projects are are becoming more not just in Indian country but throughout the United States. Um, so even you know, like where I'm where I live right now in Denver, um, there have there's always projects going on in the Front Range in Colorado. Um, New Mexico seems like it's ramping up. We've had some trainees that were from, lived in Albuquerque. They came up to a project up in Boulder and then they went down to um, Albuquerque where they're currently, you know, one was promoted to crew lead for a private company. Um, and the other one is working on his electrical license and the company's paying for it. So they got their start with our, our training, but they just got a, we showed them a career pathway and opportunities and they took advantage of it. So, but of, of course in California, Washington state, Oregon, um, we're seeing more and more um, states um, just become real big players and a lot of opportunities for projects and, and employment and career path. Okay, thanks, Tim. Um, a question on uh, um, in interactions with 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 utilities. Uh, so, Sh Chantel, your project can you can you uh, describe or kind of briefly summarize uh, the how your projects are are interfacing with utilities and are they uh, supportive? Um, is the PPA um, you know, selling power to the utility, or is it uh, an agreement with, with Revolution? Thanks. Yes, uh, thank you. Um, yeah, our, again, uh, a complete learning experience um, on this. Uh, so things that we did learn in our area, because there's not a lot of solar and there are no sort of solar companies, um, this being the first, and then the main kind of right out the gate with the, the large capacity. Um, and then us actually realizing as a tribe uh, the capacity that we do provide to the utility companies is that, uh, for the honesty, is that they uh, realize that, you know, if we decided to kind of shift and kind of take our power back, they, they have to actually start working with us. Um, smaller uh, utility companies, we have two separate ones that we uh, utilize currently. Uh, one a little bit more willing, that's a lot smaller. Uh, the larger companies, um, not as willing, um, but I, I guess ultimately cooperating, um, knowing that you know we are a big uh, consumer. Um, so learning the utilities and going over the utility contracts, that's um, been an experience as well. Um, and we didn't actually have the eternal capacity for even our uh, in-house attorney. Um, so that's been a, a, a new venture for them to learn as well. Um, and then looking at, you know, the difference between a power purchase agreement to power sales and how to actually utilize um, our utility contracts. It's, um, it's a definite um, learning experience for everybody, including the utility company. Um, and then looking at, you know, policies that are set uh, within your state. Um, even though um, some, some things in like, you know, um, uh, Dan had mentioned earlier about jurisdiction, and that that has come into your utility contracting has a lot to play as well. Um, some permitting situations um, ends up looking different than when you're on the outside of the reservational boundaries. Um, but it also does give us a little bit of leverage. So you know, we um, as long as we maintain you know our own authority and sticking to you know uh, you know. They can subject us to some things and some things they they can't. Um, so it's a definite. Um, if you can, uh, you know, work with a third party, at least utility company, a utility uh, uh, expert. Um, I would definitely suggest that. Um, and doing a mutual mutual agreement uh, between your tribe, utility, a third party utility uh, expert. Um, and then your uh, solar company, uh, so that all those responsibilities are laid out. Um, it's definitely something that we've learned here. Um, I've um, contacted a few of the uh, Canada tribe uh, that is also very suggested to, and from their own phenomenology and kind of working through it um, to negate some of the issues. That was uh, another suggestion is to really separate out those responsibilities uh, with mutual agreement. 
um, again, from your tribe to utility contracting to the solar companies and making sure everybody's um, doing their part so that you can have a little bit more of a smooth um, transition uh, for for your uh, solar projects. Thank you. Thanks, Chantel. Um, let's, let's try to squeeze in one last question quickly. Um, and uh, uh, I'm going to broaden it a little bit. It, what sort of funding is there available for um, for training? Like, are, is anybody aware of um, uh, um, scholarships or, or anything of the like to for an individual that's looking to get trained in the solar space? Uh, this is Tim again. Um, we par we've partnered with the Blue Lake Rancheria on workforce development training. Um, again, with our Boulder project and other projects, um, we'd be able to incorporate that. Um, so I would just, you know, uh, get in contact with us as far as, you know, um, the opportunities coming up and also gridalternatives.org, our website. We have a tribal program menu. Um, we definitely have updates um, on that as far as, you know, again, project based installer uh, and temporary uh, paid training for like a week or two weeks at a time at, at times. Um, so just encourage that. Thanks, Tim. Uh, this is also this is Chantal Green. Uh, um, so I would also like to mention um, that kind of work hand in hand with solar, uh, both the renewable energy and then sustainable engineering. Uh, you know, we are partnering with the community rebuild, which can be found at their website, uh, communityrebuild.com, um, and they do provide. If you write to them, they do provide free education uh, from from anybody. If you go to their website, you can actually walk through the steps for. Uh, uh, workforce training development, you can get free education, uh, free living, uh, free stipend, um, and then you do provide for, uh, you know, all for everything for food and move in housing. And uh, it's just go to their website and they will walk you through the steps to actually apply. Uh, and that's, that's free education to, to anybody looking to do that. Uh, built within that is also solar education uh, and then renewable materials. Uh, for uh, sustainable engineering and construction. Excellent. Thanks, Chantel. With that, I think we're out of time, so um, let's wrap it up here. Um, we have our last slide here, it just shows our, our final webinar of the 2021 series. Um, it's titled Utility Scale Solar Development on Tribal Lands on December 8th. Uh, please do join us for that if you're able to. Um, thanks to our audience for participating today, and thanks for all of our uh, presenters for their, their hard work and sharing their, their knowledge and insight here today. Um, we look forward to our audience joining us on future webinars, and this concludes the webinar for today. Good day. Thanks all. <laughs>